Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Welcome, Tam Fam, wherever you are. We are live, and it was behind those doors as I said live, and I, and I said a prayer. I always say a prayer before I come out, but today's prayer um, hit in a different way. What does it mean to keep standing when the odds are against you? I'm not talking about a little setback here and there. We're talking odds so devastating. Finding a path forward seems impossible. After losing their three-year-old son in a drowning accident at the family's home, country music singer Granger Smith and his wife Amber are opening up for the first time in a daytime TV interview. The heartbreaking loss happened as life seemed perfect with the odds in their family's favor. Country music star Granger Smith and his wife Amber were living their American dream with sold out shows around the country and three beautiful kids, London, Lincoln and River, back at their farmhouse in Texas, life could not be sweeter. Then in 2019, on a seemingly normal day while Amber was upstairs taking a shower, Granger was outside getting in some quality time with his kids before hitting the road again. Little did they know that day would change their lives forever. I glanced over my left shoulder and my heart stopped. I saw every parent's worst nightmare. Just 15 paces away from me, inside our gated and locked pool, I saw River in the water face down. His normally active little body wasn't moving. I rushed to the pool, flung the gate open, crashed into the water and picked him up. He was lifeless and cold, like a doll. His face and arms were purple, and his brown eyes were wide open, rolling around aimlessly in his head. Panic devoured me. When EMTs arrived, they were able to get River's heart beating again, but his brain had been without oxygen for 10 minutes. River was taken to the hospital as the family prayed for a miracle. The next day, a team of neurologists delivered the heartbreaking news three-year-old River would not recover. Now Granger is opening up about the guilt, the grief, and how God helped his family get through this tragedy against all odds. Here for a daytime exclusive, please welcome to the show Granger Smith and his wife Amber. Please have a seat, have a seat. Um, I was just thinking about you a lot since you said you were ready to talk about this. Um, River would have turned seven mm. this past May. Mm. You said, hmm. Mm. Well, I said, hmm, because um, it's interesting. Early on, we started saying things like, Amber and I started saying, you know what, we're not going to count the years we're not going to look at a, a certain day and go, oh, this was graduation day from high school, or this was, oh, he would have been going to prom, or we wouldn't look at other uh, kids and think River would be that age now because that would, well, first of all, it would be hard on us, but also it didn't exist. That, that's, that's an impossible scenario because he was only meant to be three. You talk, I know you have, other children in the family. And you talk about, Amber, the accident, London and Lincoln, they were seven and five at the time. You decided to tell them exactly what happened that day. That you did not, kind of picking up on what Granger said, you didn't want to pretend. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how, mm. I don't. In the hospital, they were. We had. They had a team of, of grief counselors come in, and they said, "You have to just be very honest with your children. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't tell them things like he's sleeping, he's in a better place. You need to be very honest about the situation." And so we went home, and that's exactly what we did. We we told them what happened. We said that that his ride son, home to tell them. What, I mean, you are still processing what happened. Oh, yeah. You don't know fully how or what happened, and now you've the responsibility of telling them something you haven't even processed. What is that ride like home? Yeah, it was intense. Uh, like you said, there was a lot of stuff going on in our head and the number one priority at that point really was telling the siblings that their little brother's not coming home. They didn't know. So they, they were riding with chalk on the driveway, 
Welcome Home River, and they had hearts and balloons all on the driveway. And they didn't know. So we drove in on, with one mission to, to tell them exactly what happened. In your book, you go into, I mean, I don't know if I could have told some of the things that you told, especially when it comes to the guilt um, that you're still processing. I just want to be clear before we talk about what you wrote regarding guilt, because you were both home the day this happened. According to the CDC, the leading cause of death in children one to four drowning. It's also the second leading cause of unintentional injury, death in kids five to 14. And the Consumer Product Safety Commission says 69% of drowning deaths in children under five happen when they, they, when they were not expected to be at or in the pool. So this happens. Did you know that? I did not know it until I asked my team. I have a four-year-old, I have a pool. Yeah. I grew up in Texas, we're all Texas folks. And I, I know I, as a reporter, I've covered it so many times, but I didn't know that it was the leading cause of death in children one to four. You talk about the guilt though, because you're both there. And you said you blame yourself. You said, I had no idea how to deal with this kind of pain. It broke into my world like a thief and stole my joy, my passion for life, my sanity, and replaced it with something far more sinister, guilt. It just about killed me. Help us understand how you were processing that guilt. I know that you were outside with the kids and then you see River in that pool. What was the guilt? Well, I was processing it badly. I was doing a terrible job at it because it was crushing me. Um, what did you feel you, guilty about? Well, I felt guilty about failing at the one thing. You know, it's almost a joke that people say, here's the one thing you gotta do is just keep them alive till they're 18 and get them out of the house. It's a, it's a joke. And I failed at that one thing. I failed at keeping my son alive when all I had to do was be there for him. And I was in the yard, I was responsible. I was the responsible adult. Amber was in the house. I had all three kids with me and I failed at that. And that is something that was very hard. Uh, it just about killed me trying to cope with that guilt. What you talk about in the book, Amber, you also had guilt as well. I mean, sometimes they call it survivor's guilt. When it's a parent, I, I don't even know if grief counselors have a title for it. When you are, as you said, the parent whose job it is to protect. What was your guilt that you felt? The same feeling that it's our job to keep him safe. And there was a moment that Granger had asked me to bring the boys inside. And I had had a long day and I needed to take a shower. And I said, I just need a break. So I went in to take a shower. So I felt guilt that if I, maybe if I would have just brought the boys inside, this wouldn't have happened. But then I was also grieving for the heavy guilt that he was feeling, blaming himself, when it can happen to anybody. You said something in the book and you've talked about your relationship because at the time you were you married nine years, nine mm -hmm. years, and you made a promise, you, almost a deal, that you were not going to break up. Mm -hmm. Because we do know um, so often when there's a tragedy, especially involving a child, it ends the marriage because the unit turns on each other. You point the finger, but you made a pro promise. Yeah, a, a very unromantic promise. It was, it was a negotiation. It was a deal, you know? It was like a business deal, and we did that in the hospital. We were out at this little serenity garden that they had at the children's hospital, and, and when we were, while we were waiting to, to figure out what they were going to do with River, who, who had already passed, we sat up there and looked at that serenity garden, and we just looked at each other, and we said, we have to make an agreement that we're going to do this. And it was like a handshake deal. We're not going to fail each other. I'm going to be here for you. You be here for me. We How are going to fight. How are you present enough to make that that decision? <laughs> there, that's a question that we we think about a lot. There was a lot of few. Uh, there was a, some things that we did in that hospital that we said that was outside of what we possibly could have done in the shock that we were in. So I would say the grace of God showed Himself in a, a few moments where we needed it.